Uh, with that, let's give a, a warm welcome to Dr. Clary. Talking about flood rocks, uh, so it would be a little less sciencey, maybe a little more fun uh, as we go about this. But I want to talk about the extinction problem. I debuted this yesterday at the Discovery Center. We had Dinosaur Week, and we finished it up. And the astronomy group that meets once a month, called the Day Four Group, a uh, local group in Dallas, met. And so I kind of want to do a little dinosaur, combine it with some astronomy. So I said, "How about the asteroid idea?" That's the story you hear in school now. That's the story you see in the movies. I guess there's a new movie called 65. They just came out, or it's coming out, and they actually got the year wrong. It should be 66, but they changed that. We'll talk about that later. Uh, you know, what's a million years between friends? And so they, they did change that, as, as we'll see later. Uh, so the asteroid didn't hit 65 million years ago, according to their story, it hit 66. So, yeah. Again, what's a million dollars to the government? It's nothing. Uh, I mean, it might be, you know, what do you do? All right, we're going to talk about this and other myths. I don't believe this actually is true by any means. I don't believe the Earth is old. I believe the Earth is about 6,000 years old. That's what the Bible talks about through the genealogies. Uh, you know, Bishop Usher was right. Maybe not the exact time and date that he put forth, but about the number of years. Uh, we don't disagree with that at all. The Bible is true, and the genealogies are true. And even if you're missing some names in between, it still gives you the name of the person and the name of how old that person was when this person was born and this person. So even if there's names in between, you still have exact dates. And so uh, that's one of the things we talk about in our books. Now, uh, what Dave is going to give away for our drawing, for those of you who have signed up, is going to give away some books, not just, you know, acts and facts. We have, you know, these are free. You can sign up and get this for free every other month. Uh, but, and you can also go to our website for free and put in a query, put in, you know, questions you have. And we have a lot of articles, thousands of articles that we've published they can maybe answer the questions or can get a hold of us through our contact as well. Right? They can go to contact, icr.org, go to contact and do that. But anyway, let's get started with dinosaurs a little bit because we have this thing on the stage. We went through and hauled this big old T-Rex skull all the way here. This is a replica, but it's about a $10,000 replica uh, of T-Rex Stan, who was found by a guy named Stan. And it's the most, one of the most complete skulls of all T-Rexes. And to find out when they did the brain case in here, the T-Rex brain is only about this big. And it's very small. It's shaped like a crocodile's brain. And so you can hear the stories out there. One of the myths we're going to talk about is that dinosaurs turned into birds. And they're related to birds and all this. But the, real, the brain and the size of these things matches more with a cold-blooded reptile. And, and really matches the shape of a reptile's brain as well. But back here with the eyes, these are the eye sockets back here. And God designed this with a lot of holes called fenestra to lighten the skull. Because if it was a solid, and this is a nose, but if you had a solid skull, it would be so heavy that the T-Rex would just lay down all day long. And so God knew what he was doing when we designed this. And the teeth, they're all different lengths because you're getting new teeth all the time. So if you come up and look later, you'll see there's a new tooth coming in here. When this animal was killed in the flood, it was buried. It had different length teeth because they're always growing new teeth. So like sharks, dinosaurs grew new teeth all the time, at least most of the ones that we've studied, plant eaters or meat eaters. And this thing originally was created as a plant eater, as we'll see later, because everything was. So let's go through the, some of the questions that people might have. Aren't dinosaurs millions of years old? That's what you hear all the time. That's what you're taught in schools. That's what you're taught at schools, even like Baylor University. They teach millions of years. They teach evolution up there as well. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of Christian schools have gone that way. They just teach the secular evolutionary story. And so your kids are going to school, public schools like I went to. You get indoctrinated with evolution. That's why you need resources like the original Genesis flood book. That's all we had. That's all we had. Our brothers and I, we had to read through parts of that to see there's another story out there that they're not telling us. And so we have resources. That's what those resources are for. I can't tell you as much as those books can tell you. And those are the kind of books you need if you go off to college or your grandkids are going off to college or you're going off to college. Uh, those are the kind of things you need. That's why we provide those. We don't make a lot of money on them. We, we, you know, that 500-page book I have back there, if that was a college textbook, it'd be $160, but we charge 40 
And so that's about our most expensive book we, we sell. So it's, there's, we try to make them as cheap as possible. And then the question people often have, and they see this, is didn't dinosaurs go extinct before humans? And that's what that's the story is. They, they went extinct 66 million years ago. Humans didn't evolve until you know, two or three million years ago, whatever the story is now. Uh, but that's not true either. We'll see from the Bible, God created humans and dinosaurs on the same day. And so they were living together, maybe just different areas of the world. Uh, and my biggest question is, will we ever see these gas prices again? <laughs> yeah, so there's my daughter and I back years ago when I had a nice dark mustache and I had a little more hair at the time in a St. Clair gas station, if you're familiar with those. So what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? And uh, you'll never see the word dinosaur in the Bible, and we'll explain why in a minute. Uh, but God does talk about the beast of the earth. And so he lumps everything, I think, into the beast of the earth. In the day six, God made the beast of the earth according to its kind. And of course, day six, he also made Adam and Eve. And so he made it, you know, the same day all the land animals were created on the same day. Day five, he made the birds. And he made the things that swim in the oceans and the waters. And day six, he made the land animals. So he made birds day earlier than dinosaurs, even the creation week. Now, <coughs> excuse me, dinosaurs are created to eat plants. <coughs> there, I knew it was coming. Also, to every beast of the earth, I've given every green herb for food. Let me have a little sip of water. It's the dry Texas air. It's not like Midland. Every green herb for food. So this thing back here had to eat plants as well. God had specific plants that would nourish this thing's body. And whatever it was, we don't know. Because all we see in the flood record is after things got wicked, after 1,600 years, dinosaurs were eating each other. And we do find T-Rex teeth, which are very distinctive, embedded in some dinosaur bones that healed over. So I didn't even kill the animal all the time. It just kind of healed over. But there's specific teeth. We know they were eating each other, bite marks and teeth marks. And so, but originally, God made everything where you just eat plants. Plants were not considered death. Animals were considered death. And so, unfortunately, after Adam and Eve sinned, everything went, started going spiraling out of control. And dinosaurs started eating each other. And humans... I think lived in separate areas mostly from dinosaurs for a reason. And most mammals lived in separate areas from dinosaurs. The lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Uh, they all lived in separate areas from the dinosaurs as well. We don't find lions and tigers and bears mixed with the bones of dinosaurs either. We find squirrels and beaver-like animals that lived in swamps and lowland areas. That's what we find with dinosaurs. And so there, I think there was a, an elevation difference that allowed different plants, different animals to live in different areas. And only the teenage boys who were trying to show off went to see the dinosaurs. And most of them never returned, I think. So that's kind of how it goes. But you know how teenage boys are. Oh, I can do that. Maybe not. Anyway, creatures that moved along the ground, it says dinosaurs, you know, were on the ark because God didn't exclude anything from the ark. He said, all two of every kind I will bring to the ark. So God brought two of every kind to the ark. And Noah and his family had to bring on the food, of course, in Genesis uh, 721 talks about everything on land perished that had the breath of life by day 150 of the flood. So the flood reached its peak around day 150, according to the Bible. We see that in the rock record, same sort of thing, a progressive flood. As some of you were around for the first talk, and that's when everything was dead. If it was a land animal or a human, you were dead at that point if you weren't on the ark. And so the, the ark is very, very important. It was salvation. You know, that door was salvation. If you walked through, you were saved. Just like today, we have to make that choice for Christ. Jesus is our door of salvation today. We have to believe not that there's going to be a flood. We have to believe that Jesus died for our sins. We can't save ourselves. Only through the blood of Christ can we be saved. But he did it. There's nothing else we have to do. You, know, you don't have to study in a monastery for years and years to become a Christian. It's instantaneous as soon as you believe. The moment you believe, you get the Holy Spirit. Noah's Ark was very, very big. There was plenty of room for all the dinosaurs because really, we'll see in a minute here there weren't really that many dinosaurs needed on the Ark. Uh, this is about the minimum size, 450 to 500 feet long, 75 foot wide and 45 foot high with three decks. That's what the Bible tells us. We don't know any more about it other than that, but there's plenty of room for all the animals. People have done feasibility studies. We published one at ICR uh, 20, 15, 20 years ago. It's still available. And he over... Well, overly conservative. He put more animals on there probably than was really necessary. And there's still plenty of room. Only filled half the ark. Uh, so plenty of room for food. We did the math at ICR because we love math. Who doesn't love math? That math is the best. I forgot a lot of my math, sadly. At least my calculus. But uh, we did the math. 
and looked at 350 dinosaurs. They had good measurements on the bone legs and bone circumferences, and they could do this study. Uh, you're looking at the femur bone of a two-legged animal. The minimum size of that femur tells you the optimum weight of that animal. Now, as humans, we can balloon out and shrink and all that, but most animals are living on the edge. You know, you, the lions and tigers and bears don't, you know, you don't see fat lions and tigers and bears. They get fat for a reason. If they're going to suffer through the winter, they have to hibernate, that sort of thing. But you can kind of tell the weight of an animal by the size of the bones that God designed to go with it. And the same thing is true of dinosaurs. So they estimate dinosaur weight based on the bone circumference. Four-legged ones, you've got to use the front bone and the back bone. But we found out this is the average. Average adult size with the size of an American bison, 1,100 or so pounds, whatever that is, average size. Uh, but God probably brought juveniles on the ark, not adults, not full-size adults. And so they were smaller dinosaurs versus bigger. And if you come to our Discovery Center, we have a few uh, rooms on the ark. We don't have a full ark. But we have a few rooms where you can kind of get the idea with some dinosaurs and some velociraptors that are only about this big, really. Uh, velociraptors were not much smaller. Steven Spielberg liked the name velociraptor, so he stuck it on a Deinonychus, which is really a different dinosaur. It's a raptor still, but a completely different than true velociraptors, and they, and they probably weren't they're very smart either. The brain of these things were shaped like alligators and crocodiles. They're not very smart. They just bite things, and they ask questions later. And so dinosaurs probably were the same. Uh, they probably couldn't steam up the window, I don't believe. There's strong evidence that they were warm-blooded. I believe they were probably cold-blooded. There is some evidence for that. You know, they steamed the glass and in the first movie. That, that wouldn't have happened. That's, they're pushing their worldviews on you. you know, they're making the dinosaurs smart. And then now they're putting feathers on them, which we'll talk about later. Getting ahead of myself, which I, I disagree with as well. But there's really only about 60 kinds of dinosaurs, uh, maybe 70. You know, I'll give you 10 more, but you just double that. That's why on the ark, you need 120, 140 dinosaur kinds. There's just a lot of variety, as we'll see. Just like you all look a little different. Each and every one of you. Just like that, dinosaurs all look a little different. And it says in 2 Timothy 4, 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth in the end times. And they shall be turned into fables. And this is exactly what people do today when they talk about evolution. They make it sound like this is science. Those creationists are crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. But when you follow the rocks, when you follow the real data, we'll see today what the rocks show is a completely different story than what you're taught in school. Back in the 19th century, geologists decided, we're going to change the course of science and we're going to toss the writings of Moses out. And they came up with deep time. Hutton developed deep time about 1790s. And that became Lyell's writings. And, and Lyell was read by Darwin when he was on his expedition in the 1830s. And Darwin said, oh, deep time. We got time for evolution then. And so he found some evidence, what he thought was evidence of evolution. But really, he didn't show any evidence of evolution. He just showed different finches with different beaks. And those beaks can develop within a generation or two. They don't take great periods of time. So everything he shows is evidence of evolution. There really isn't any evidence for evolution. Nothing is evolving to anything else. Nothing ever has. Even the rock record doesn't show that. The fossils don't show it. We'll talk more about that as we go along. So, but unfortunately, people turn their way from the truth because they don't want to hear about God being the creator, God being our only source of salvation through Jesus. They want to make their own path. They want to disregard all that. But the facts are found in the rocks, just like when you look at the rocks, evidence for the flood, you can see the evidence for the flood in the rocks. You can look at the fossils in the rocks, like these things, and you see there's evidence of not only special created kinds that work wonderfully, but they just show up fully formed and ready to go. The rocks don't lie. People do. So keep that in mind. The rocks don't lie. The fossils don't lie. People do. So a dinosaur, the word dinosaur wasn't even invented or coined until 1841 by this happy-looking guy here, Sir Richard Owen. Uh, he was a world-renowned anatomist at the time, took over for Cuvier, who was a French anatomist. Uh, but then he kind of passed the torch over across the uh, English Channel to England, and Sir Richard Owen became the world-renowned anatomist, looked at more bones of animals than anything else. And when he started seeing just the beginnings of dinosaur discoveries in the 1820s and 1830s, he realized this is a special group of reptile that walks erect. So if you look at dinosaurs, they walk upright. Their legs come straight down like you and I do. They have hip sockets, holes in the hips, and that's what he identified. He didn't have very good specimens. He just had a few bones. They came to the United States 20, 30, 40 years later, started finding more complete specimens. They really kind of put dinosaurs on the map. 
you know, once the U.S. started to find dinosaurs in the American West, particularly. But even here in Texas, you can find dinosaurs similar to this called the Acrocanthosaurus up by Glen Rose and its footprints. But dinosaurs walk upright. When you see the footprints, they're very close together. So it's been verified, whereas lizards and reptiles and crocodiles all sprawl, dragging their bellies. Dinosaurs were very leggy animals. This is important because later in my talk, I'm going to talk about dinosaur legs coming straight down from their bodies before they even knew this. But this is why the word dinosaur is not in your Bible, because it wasn't invented until after the Bible was translated in the King James in 1611. So again, 200 years later plus, don't do math in public, 200, do the math, 230 years later, I think 230 years later, uh, you finally have the word dinosaur, so it's not in the Bible. But there is things like behemoth and leviathan, which I believe are dinosaurs, we'll talk about later. But let's go through our myths before we get too carried away. Uh, well, there's four things I want to talk about. One, the dinosaurs had many ancestors. You hear this all the time. Secondly, they evolved into birds. This is very, very common. It's in all the movies. They're shoving it down the kids' throats. Even the TV shows, little for little kids. And that they're millions of years old. This is the current age of dinosaurs, I believe, but it does change every so often. They keep finding one a little bit deeper. So they push that 232 to 235. You know, who knows what it'll be in 10 years. But they did change the 65, which the movie didn't catch about 12, 15 years ago to 66. So they recalibrated their age dating, which I believe are all wrong anyway. And they said, oh no, 66 million years ago. So the asteroid didn't hit 65 million years ago. So if you dialed your time machine, went back in time, 65 million years ago, you would have missed it by a million years. Which, you know, according to their story, I don't believe there ever was one, was, we'll see. There's not strong evidence for an asteroid. And, and it didn't wipe out the dinosaurs. But anyway, number four, the myth that they teach you is that dinosaurs went extinct from an asteroid. And I have had little six and seven year old kids argue with me about this, you know, because they saw it on TV, they saw it on their little you know, PBS shows or whatever they're watching, Blippi or something like that, one of those shows. You guys watch Blippi? I hope you don't. <clears throat> I had to watch too much of that with my grandkids. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna start dancing like Blippi up here. And he says, I think I'm having a seizure, but I'm not. Uh, anyway, I don't believe they went extinct from an asteroid, but that's the story they're teaching. Even paleontologists, they wait. No, it doesn't work because we've got frogs. Bob Bakker argues there's frogs from the Cretaceous all the way across the boundary. Why didn't the frogs get killed by the asteroid? And he gets ignored. And so even you know, prominent paleontologists are kind of talked out of this. This is the story. We're sticking with it. The asteroid, asteroid, asteroid. And so unfortunately, we'll see there isn't a lot of evidence that asteroid actually hit. We'll look at that. Let's look at the first thing. Dinosaurs have any ancestors, so you know, people are always saying there's a new ancestor to T-Rex. Let's see if there really was. But we'll start with the Ceratopsians, because my daughter's in this picture. She's for scale. She's now 32. She's a nurse in Colorado Springs, but she used to go on dinosaur digs with me when she was growing up. So here we are, University of Wyoming in their museum there looking at a Triceratops skull. And these are the Ceratopsians, means horn heads. And see, so the big frills, some of the biggest skulls uh, of all dinosaurs were created for these ceratopsians. And they have all different shapes to the horns. This particular type has two horns and a, a third horn in the nose, so triceratops, tri horned, three horned dinosaur. And uh, they lived in this, buried in the same rocks with these things. Tur tur you know, we'll talk about that a little bit. Lots of variety. It's like looking at you guys right now. That's what I see. Lots of variety. Maybe not horns on your heads. But lots of variety. And that's what these things had. Each family probably had different shaped horns. And so lots of different variety. When these were born, they all looked the same. The little hatchlings that they find, the few that they have found, all look very similar. Uh, and they don't grow into these horns. It's almost like family units. Different families develop different traits. They kind of bred within themselves, and they brought out different traits. So you have all these ceratopsians. And only probably one or two of these were actually biblical kinds that would have been brought on the ark. So there's a lot of species out there, 1,400, 1,500 species of dinosaurs. And a lot of them, they realize later they already named it, so they have to keep eliminating species. Uh, but there's a lot of them, they're, they're very similar. So there's really not that many kinds of dinosaurs. But we look for ancestors, look at the rocks. And you look for ancestors to the T-Rex or the Ceratops, and we'll talk about the T-Rex in a minute. You look down the road, the Ceratopsians are found in what's called Cretaceous level rocks. That's where you find our dinosaurs in Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous rocks. All the T-Rexes are found in the Acrocanthosaurus up here in the Cretaceous rocks, which is mostly what's below your feet here. I know it's up at Glen Rose. But oddly, they're walking in limestone in Glen Rose, which is uh, ocean rock, which is kind of odd. But that's because of the flood. But here we are, 
burying these things in the Cretaceous rocks. When you look below that, there's nothing that looks like a T-Rex. You go down to the Jurassic, there's nothing. Go to the Triassic, there's nothing. You know, there really is no ancestors to the T-Rex. They just show up fully formed because that's the level they were living at during the flood and they were buried and they're gone. Let's look at the T-Rex itself. Here's Tyrannosaurus rex Sioux, the Field Museum in Chicago, if you've ever been there. I think they moved it now. They put something else in this display, but they still have it over there. They spent $8 million to buy this. It's 90% complete, and most of the bones are, you know, which is very unusual. Most dinosaurs, you're lucky to get 30, 40% of a dinosaur, usually just a few bones. And that's why they misnamed them a lot of times. But this one's pretty complete. The skull of this is up on a second level. That's a kind of reinflated skull. The, the real skull is kind of squished by the rapid burial. It was kind of all in a ball when they found it, wound up, because these big waves are coming in, burying these things alive and just squishing them uh, as these big tsunami waves washed in. But let's look at the ancestors then. I got a chance to dig on a T-Rex type of dinosaur called a Displadiosaurus up in Montana, which is a Tyrannosaur kind, but just a little smaller. It's only 25 foot or so. And you can see the teeth there next to my rock hammer. Yeah, the teeth on these are about this big. The T-Rex teeth like this, counting the roots of some of these things sometimes are this big. And so they're huge, thick teeth, uh, very, very impressive uh, dinosaurs to find. So it's kind of fun to dig at them. But you look in the rocks, you know, where are the ancestors of these, just like the Ceratopsians? That's why I might have misspoke earlier. It's the same story. They're all found in the upper Cretaceous levels. They're not even found in the lower Cretaceous. You know, there's nothing like a T-Rex in the lower Cretaceous. There's nothing in the Jurassic, nothing in the Triassic that looks like a T-Rex. There's other predator dinosaurs that became predators after the fall but they don't look like T-Rex. So there really is no ancestor. And if you don't believe me, David Weisample, who is a world-renowned paleontologist from Johns Hopkins University, he's the lead author of the Bible of Dinosaur Paleontology called the Dinosauria. They consider that their dinosaur Bible. And he says, from my reading of the fossil record of dinosaurs, you can read this yourself, no direct ancestors have been discovered for any dinosaur species. And he's seen more dinosaurs than Sir Richard Owen. We only saw a few. You know, this, this guy has seen hundreds and hundreds of dinosaurs. And he says there's not one that shows an ancestry or anything. They just show up fully formed, just the way God created them. They were buried at that level in the flood. He goes, alas, my list of dinosaurian ancestors is an empty one. Here you can see the most recent uh, Spinosaurus that was discovered in Morocco about six, seven years ago, uh, compared to a, a man there. It's actually bigger than a T-Rex. It's 50 foot long. So this is probably the biggest predatory dinosaur of all is a Spinosaurus, which I think the T-Rex would have beat him in the fight. But, you know, what does Hollywood know? Myth busting number one, and this is, this is one of my favorite dinosaurs. This is a or a protoceratops, small kind of triceratops without the horns, in Mongolia with a velociraptor, which is again about this big. And so these really weren't that big, but you can see it's about to bite down the velociraptor's arm and they were buried instantly. That's the position they found them in. So that's how fast this burial was. It's like two WWE wrestlers going at it. Get the rock in there and Hulk Hogan and they're holding on and they're buried instantly, frozen that way for thousands of years. There they are. So they, some amazing discoveries out there. But there's no known ancestors to any dinosaur groups. David Weisample admits it. And you look in the rocks, they don't, there's none. All fossils, including the trilobites and the brachiopods and the seashells and corals, all show up in the rocks fully formed without ancestors. They look for trilobites, for example, these little arthropods. They look down below in the rocks below and they've searched and searched and searched. And we've written about this on our website and there is nothing. They know exactly where they should be and there's nothing. They just show up fully formed. And that's what you'd expect in a global flood. Things being buried environment by environment by environment. You see different animals, different critters as the flood progressed. And it's the same pattern on every continent because it was a global flood. So let's look at our second point. Dinosaurs evolved into birds. This is really big in the Jurassic Park movies, Jurassic World movies, and in your science classrooms. If you go to college or you go to high school or junior high, even down to the elementary levels, they're teaching this stuff. Dinosaurs evolved into birds and they show you this just like the humans evolved into, you know, from apes into humans. They show the same false story. And this is false because they know it's false because the things in the middle here are found below the things in, at the top. And so they're all out of order. And I'll talk about one of those examples in a minute. Uh, this did not happen, folks. This is what they want to happen because they want things to evolve. So what did some dinosaurs look like this? 
and have feathers. And we see this in the Jurassic World movie, the latest one. And not only are they running around through snow throughout that whole movie, which I think is, is ludicrous because they're, to me, the evidence supports these are cold-blooded, which they wouldn't be living in snow, uh, even after the flood. Uh, it, but you wouldn't find them jumping in the water with feathers on and swimming around the water with feathers and jumping back out. So anybody see that movie? You know what I'm talking about? That's just craziness. So they, they say it's crazy talk, but it's Hollywood. This is a true bird. This is a bird that has feathers. This is Archaeopteryx. And there's a replica of this on our wall outside uh, the ICR Discovery Center. On the outside wall, we have some iconic fossils. This is an iconic fossil. This is the first bird. And there may be some earlier ones that there's debatable, but this, everybody agrees this is a bird. It had a bony tail with feathers on it. It had legs, back legs, it had some feathers on it. Front legs with feathers, they believe this could fly like a pheasant. And so it was buried in rocks, in the Jurassic rocks, which is the middle of the dinosaur rocks. Keep that in mind. This is Sinoceropteryx, which is supposed to have proto-feathers. See those little hair-looking stuff? They call those proto-feathers because they believe that scales somehow magically evolved into feathers. And they had to go through this proto-feather stage, so they see these dinosaurs, they're laid out really well, squished by the flood, and they have these, what looks like, hair coming off them. They call them proto-feathers. But are they really proto-feathers? Stephen Brissett, paleontologist at the University of Edinburgh in uh, Scotland, says the bones of these species are covered with a thick, feathery fluff, not quill pen feathers of living birds, but simpler, which there's nothing simple. But anyway, we'll, we'll go with it. Simpler filament-like feathers that look like hair. So basically he's saying these aren't real feathers, they look like hair. And that's what proto-feathers are supposed to be. So you go back and look at that, it kind of looks like hair. Well, what is it really? Well, there were some empirical studies done back in 2005 by a guy named Alan Fiducia, who is an evolutionist. He's a bird paleontologist. And he's, he's trying to say, no, wait a minute, birds and dinosaurs, no, they're different. And he, he admits this, but they ignore him too because he goes against the mainstream story. And so he's feeling the, you know, like us as creationists, we get ignored all the time too. So he's feeling the same problem. But he said this in 2005 and he studied animals, did some, he squished a dolphin. And he showed this dolphin when he squished it, doesn't have a lot of hair on it, a little bit of hair, but he squished it and he got all these fibers coming off the side. So all that is is collagen from the skin of the dolphin that was buried so fast it made it look like hair coming off the dolphin. And he showed that it's really just part of the collagen. So you go back to these things like this, and really he, he argues with empirical evidence showing that that's what really happens. You squish this, you get these hair-like structures coming off. That's just the collagen fibers in the skin of the reptile and in your skin. That's what makes leather. That's why you can have leather saddles. Most of you rode here on your horses because you're Texans. <laughs> and you, I thought so, but, but I found out that's not true. You guys like fossil fuels like me. And so you drove here, even if you drove your electric car, you still plugged it in, and you got some of your power from the coal plant down the street. So I don't know how green you really are when you're really plugging it into the coal plant down the street. And it's true. <laughs> but anyway, nonetheless, uh, you've, leather, leather saddles and leather shoes and everything are mostly collagen, and they do break down over time. They don't last millions of years. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So uh, what these really are, not protofeathers, they're probably just decomposing collagen that got squished in the burial of the flood. And of course, most of the so-called dinosaurs with feathers evidence comes from one location in China, which should worry you, <laughs> because not everything in China is on the up and up, as we'll find out. There's, I'll give you an example of a hoax that came from China. Uh, but this is a true bird. Again, this is very similar to Archaeopteryx. Probably should be the same kind, except it was found in Asia, in, uh, in Bavaria, where they found Archaeopteryx, but it had feathers on its legs, just like Archaeopteryx. It had a bony tail with feathers, just like Archaeopteryx. And see, they're probably very, very similar, you know, the size of a bird. But they argue this is a dinosaur with feathers. But you pull the back legs down on this thing, it doesn't walk like a dinosaur. You know, it has to walk like a bird and fall over. And so even a lot, of, there's even creation paleontologists out there, good friends of mine, who will say, oh yeah, this is a dinosaur. I'm like, no, this is a bird. We'll talk more about that. Let's go to the case from China where they found a good fraud and the UT CT scan proved it. So here, you know, some good things come out of UT in Austin here. They actually came up with, they proved that this is wrong. But this was a National Geographic show in 1999, this big old case. And they named it Archaeoraptor. It's supposed to be half bird, 
half dinosaurs eats the missing link. They finally found it. Woo well, they found out they didn't. They found a half bird and half dinosaur glued together. <laughs> and so that's what this was. And they didn't pull it out of the rocks when they, when they identified this. They bought it at a gem and rock and mineral show in Tucson, Arizona, the biggest rock and mineral show in the world. Uh, they paid $70,000 for this specimen. Fooled all the world's you know, most famous paleontologists, uh, you know, Canadian paleontologists, Phil Curry, Bob Bacher, all these people. They bought into it because that's what they wanted to see. They didn't realize it was glued together until the CT scan was done here by the University of Texas. showed, eh, this might not be real. So they actually, what they did was they did a very good job. They glued together a bird and a dinosaur, and they sold it because that's what people want to see. So this was a total hoax. They had to write a retraction, like a one-page retraction, about a year later, Nash Geographic in the back. And it's, it's kind of embarrassing. And it's because they, they, if you don't pull the thing out yourself, don't believe it. Yeah, especially if it comes from China. And there's been a few other hoaxes I don't have time to go into from China as well where they found a lot of fakes. We have a specimen from China in our office, which I still worry about. It's almost too good. I'm like, I don't really believe it. So we keep it in our offices, not in the museum, because I'm not so sure it's legit. Because uh, you can't trust the Chinese. They're really sneaky. At least they, you know, because they know what makes money. And so they'll sell it to paleontologists who want to see what they want to see. So there really are no feathered dinosaurs, and actually in 2017, and you still see this sadly in, in movies and in books, the T-Rexes were shown to not have feathers. They shows without question T-Rex had scaly skin. They hated to admit this. Uh, Phil Bell and a few of his colleagues studied, and it's because they found the skin imprints of T-Rex with the bones, and they showed they had scaly skin. But there's hundreds of imprints of scaly skin of all types of dinosaurs all over the world. Uh, I don't understand why they're trying to put the feathers on. They're trying to say what are bony tail birds are dinosaurs is the problem. They're changing the definition of what's a bird and what's a dinosaur. And so they're trying to say that when you eat Thanksgiving dinner, and I've heard Bob Bacher say this with a straight face, eating Thanksgiving dinner, you're eating a dinosaur. And so a dinosaur apparently tastes like turkey. That's what, that's what I've learned from that. That's what I get from it. So. Tasted like turkey, but uh, probably more like alligator. Birds don't walk like dinosaurs, as I was pointing out earlier. This is snow up in Dallas a year or so ago. It's like, ooh, it's snow, and I saw these little birds hopping around. Birds and dinosaurs walk completely different. You know, the birds balance on their knees and their ankles. Their hips are kind of inside their body, their thighs are inside, and they kind of walk around balancing on their knees. So they have strange looking legs compared to dinosaurs. That's why if you take Microraptor and pull its legs down, make it walk like a dinosaur, it's too front heavy and it falls over. But the paleontologists don't look at the back hips. Even the creation paleontologists don't look at the back hips. They don't realize that dinosaurs walk, you know, here's dinosaur footprints up in Colorado with me for scale. And you can see dinosaurs walk along. This one on the right is a two-legged dinosaur. You can see it's walking along very close together because they walk upright. And the other ones over there, they color these with some charcoal so you can see them, is an iguanodon, a four-legged dinosaur with a little front leg like a peg leg. And the back legs are big, the big three-toed back legs. And so you can see them walking along. Uh, they walk differently than birds. They don't hop because they balance differently. And also birds have to preen their feathers. Why well, have feathers if you can't preen them? They're not going to last long. Birds spend many hours of the day preening their feathers. Isn't there a bird biologist in here somewhere that can tell me how many hours they preen their feathers? How many hours do they preen their feathers? Anybody know? Even penguins preen their feathers. I took these pictures of the... Cheyenne Mountain Zoo up in Colorado Springs visiting my daughter. And they're preening their feathers because they got to be, if you don't preen them, you're just going to be tatters. So if this thing, look at it, how could it preen its feathers? How could these theropods, they call them, how could they preen feathers with this jaw? Yeah, it's, it's, they don't even think about these things. They just put these feathers on these things and show them in the movies. And everybody's like, oh yeah, dinosaurs have feathers. And sadly, a lot of my good friends in the creation paleontology community are saying the same thing. They don't look at the back legs. They don't think about whether they could preen their feathers or not. And so most of the Christian ministries are all saying no feathered dinosaurs, but there's a few creation paleontologists that you'll hear a different story on. But ask them about the back legs and how they could preen the feathers if you hear them talk. And uh, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's very difficult to, to show that. And the bottom line is here with why I don't believe dinosaurs evolved into birds is because you find the Archaeopteryx, that bird, in the Jurassic layers, that green layer in the middle. 
and your Deinonychus and your Velociraptor and your T-Rexes are all found in that rock layer above called the Cretaceous. So if you believe the geologic time scale of millions of years, you're looking at maybe 40 to 50 million years of time in between. You already have birds, and then you have the bird-like dinosaurs, supposedly, above it. So that's like having the grandchild before the grandparent. Has that ever happened? That's like you know, a man giving birth. Some people say you can, but I haven't seen it. Give me an example. But here we have the rocks. Clearly show birds buried in rocks below the so-called most bird-like dinosaurs. So how could they evolve into it? Well, that's not a problem if you're an evolutionist. You just change the rules of the game and you develop these ideas called ghost lineages, and you say, well, there had to be an ancestor, an unknown ancestor, from the Cretaceous level down to the maybe Triassic, below the bird, and you had another ancestor from the bird down to that same unknown ancestor, and they're a problem solved. But there's no fossil evidence. Dashed lines mean you're making it up. Hence the name ghost lineages. That's what they call them. That's not my name. That's what they publish. They talk about these in books with a straight face. They'll give you this lecture with a straight face. I'll tell you, look at that. They evolved from an unknown ancestor down below because we know they did. So they're doing verification science. They think they already know the answers, and they're trying to verify it. But yet the fossils and the rocks don't support it. Data-driven science, looking at the rocks, looking at the fossils, what do they tell you? They tell you a different story. So Gunther Weil admits this. He's a curator of the Euro Museum in Germany. He's retired now. Dinosaurs in China are not the ancestors of the birds, of course. They can't be because they're later than Archaeopteryx, that bird. They must have been older dinosaurs with feathers, yet we haven't found any evidence for them, unfortunately. So they develop these dashed lines and make stuff up. Unknown ancestor to both. Myth busting number two. The facts show the dinosaurs did not evolve into birds. You don't have to worry about this. He was crossed out. It's not going to happen. Birds are buried in rocks before the bird-like dinosaurs, and yeah, some bird-like dinosaurs are just hoaxes like Archaeoraptor and others as well. Let's move on to point three, because you guys want to get out of here eventually. David, you want to get out of here eventually? Okay. Uh, David does. Dinosaurs are supposed to be millions of years old. Let's look at that. And again, we talked about this in our first talk, a little bit about this, because it's very, very important. They took a T-Rex. Mary Schweitzer had a T-Rex thigh bone that broke in half, and she dissolved away too much bone with some acid, and she found this stuff. This is from 20, 2005. I think it's supposed to be six to eight or seven million years old. But that stuff in the picture, that A in the left side stretched like a rubber band and came back. Because she was looking at actual collagen, which they tested for later, of the T-Rex, still there after supposedly 68, 70 million years. And that red color comes from hemoglobin proteins. You know, it's just like in your blood. And they found a mosasaur. We won't have time to show, but they showed it was red, and it's where its heart was, still red because the hemoglobin is there. So they found over 120 papers now that have been published showing original proteins, original blood vessels, original tissues, and yet physical chemists have shown empirically for years these things can't last a million years under the best conditions. Sitting in the cave at the same temperature, for a million years, they show through the decay curves, these things are going to decay. Just like your leather saddle that you rode in here on is going to decay. If you leave it out in the barn for 50 years, it's going to get crumbly and kind of turn to dust. In the ground, you got rocks exposed near the surface for hundreds and hundreds of years. Groundwater, snow up in Montana, everything going through them, and yet we still find original tissues preserved in there because they're not millions of years old. These are buried in the flood thousands of years ago. Here's some more of the pictures of the things you can see. You can see the blood vessels in that one. That, that red is from the blood vessels. And you got osteocytes over here in the far right with the little philia touching each other still. Still all there. They're dead, but they're all there. They didn't decay away. They, you can see the nucleus in the osteocytes. So myth busting three, the facts show the dinosaurs are young. When you look at the rocks and what we find in the rocks, again, there's been over 120 papers now published finding different types of Proteins and blood vessels still flexible, all these things still preserved in the rocks. And the secular evolutionary community doesn't have a good answer for it. They put forth a few ideas, but they don't work in every case. And so they're still grasping at straws trying to explain these things, whereas it's not a problem for people that believe the Earth is young. The flood was recent. Let's move on to the fourth point here. Dinosaurs went extinct from an asteroid or some other crazy reason. I actually think the Flintstones are probably the best 
cartoon out there. They show post-flood, you know, humans and dinosaurs living together, and that's probably what happened. Pre-flood, they probably lived in separate areas, but post-flood, they had Dino, the dinosaur, and living in the area. And they lived in caves for a while as they were spreading out. You know, humans lived in caves after the Tower of Babel for a while. Uh, and some of them stick around because it was kind of nice, I guess. And they started with stone cultures again, and a lot of cultures are still in stone cultures. That's, that's you know, humans are smart enough to start making weapons uh, until they start, started to find metals again, went to the Bronze Age, etc. But they were doing that in the pre-flood world, the Bible tells us. They were using metals and making musical instruments in the pre-flood world. They just forgot. And uh, they took the idea of the, you know, the tiered temple all around the world. You see in Mexico, Chichen Itza. So it was a pyramid, you know, like very similar probably to the Tower of Babel, step pyramids like the Egyptians made. And so those same ideas people took with them when they traveled out from the Tower of Babel after the flood as well. But let's look at the asteroid idea, and hopefully this works. Now, this is the story you see all the time when an asteroid comes and hits the Earth, you know, right down by Mexico, Chicxulub, by the Yucatan, destroys everything. And here's what it really is. It's just a gravity anomaly. You can't see it at the surface at all. The so-called Chicxulub crater is 180, 180 kilometers wide. That's about 110 miles to you and me. Again, we use metric and science to make ourselves look smarter than you. Because you picked on us in school. We were the nerds. So we're going to get you back. <laughs> That's not really true. But uh, they, it works. All the equations are made in metric for some reason. Uh, and so anyway, it's supposed to be 110 miles wide. And it's supposed to be from a 6-mile or a 10-kilometer size asteroid to hit the Earth to make this crater. But really. Uh, there's a, what I call a tertiary basin, a very young basin that collapsed. And there's even that little blue spot that comes down from the so-called crater that they never account for. And there's a red thing coming in from the northwest up there called that Northwest Gravity High, which I think is a basement high. So I mapped this out as I was doing my studies, probably these columns around the world and went through Mexico. I looked at the eight or nine wells drilled into this structure. And I said, oh, let's take a look. Where is the evidence for this asteroid, other than a gravity anomaly, which could be a combination of that tertiary basin and that high, and they kind of just kept it to coincide right there, so you get kind of a semicircular shape. And so gravity is very, very ambiguous. And so it's, let's look at the rocks. So here's the wells drilled in there. You can see there's about eight or nine wells. And the newest one is the one offshore. And that's supposed to be where it hit that circle, uh, whether you believe the size of it or not. So let's look at the wells. So how much melt should there be? The prediction of an asteroid that big, there should be about three to four kilometers of melt, which is, you know, two miles of melt, possibly. There should be thick, thick melt in these wells. Well, they drilled into them and they found 100 to 300 meters or none. You know, 300 meters is like 300 yards. It's not that much melt. It's not a mile. It's not even one trip around your, you know, the 400 meter run around your track. It's not even one lap around, let alone a mile or two. So here, that little red spot in the middle is the thickest melt. That's 300 meters. The other ones, you either don't see it, it's too thin, like the one next to it, or it's not even there. So where's all the melt? There should have been three to four kilometers or about two miles of melt to have an asteroid that big. And they, they drilled the newest well. One of the UT professors here was part of that. And he's given presentations that I've gone to some of their presentations at the geology conferences, and I've actually argued with them a little bit. Not argued, just put up a point. They, they drilled this well. They took this core. They had all the fractures in it. They even said this. All the fractures from the, before the impact are still in the same orientation. They haven't been twisted or contorted yet. This rock was supposed to be in place by hitting it and splattered out, moved about three miles, and end up where they drilled it. But I'm like, well, how come, at, I got a Q&A afterwards, how come the pre-impact fractures didn't get contorted? As says a structural geologist who I work with folds and faults and things yeah, with oil company, how come those, you know, that bothers me that you're trying to say this stuff moved several miles, got hit, splattered, and moved way over here. How come they're still there for number one? How come they're all in the same orientation? And they looked at me like you guys are looking at me. <laughs> like they just didn't, they had no answer. And they've never addressed that to this day. To this day, nor the lack of melt, nor the lack of iridium. What they really drilled was they drilled a basement high, that high coming in from the northwest. And so when they show you the map, they usually cut it down and just show you the little circle. But it's really, I think, just a combination of a couple of structures, shallow and deep. 
and they just drilled in the basement. But yet in their article in Science Journal, the journal Science, they say, we proved it hit the peak ring. They didn't prove anything. They just hit granite, which is part of the crust of the Earth. And the fractures in it, the pre-impact fractures, are still in the same orientation. Yet this was supposed to have shot out of the side here and splattered over there several, several miles away. And it flipped over upside down, and yet there's no contortion at all. And my third and final question is, where is all the iridium? Iridium is a rare earth element that's produced by volcanoes, and it's produced by impacts. But of course, they just tell you, oh, iridium, it's an impact. Iridium doesn't necessarily mean an impact, because there's volcanoes in Indonesia that produce lots of iridium. So the volcanoes were peaking about the time of the Cretaceous in the flood year. You can, the rocks that I'm mapping out, I can see when the volcanoes were happening. I'm mapping out the volcanoes and the sediments. And I can see there was a big peak in volcanic activity as you got towards the end of the flood, particularly the Cretaceous. And this is supposed to be the ending of the Cretaceous when this hit. And, but there's a lot of volcanoes. And so iridium can come from that. You go to Montana, there's one hill has iridium at the boundary of the Cretaceous to the next rock unit above. And the next hill over doesn't have any. So it's not universal like they tell you. you know, they might have found it in different places, but a lot of places don't have it. And the biggest problem is it's not at the smoking gun. There's almost no iridium here, only traces of iridium in three wells of those eight or nine wells. Where's the smoke? It's supposed to shine out all this dust cloud. It's supposed to be this iridium cloud all over the world. It's not everywhere. It's just in selected locations because there's volcanoes all over the world at the same time. So I believe the iridium is caused not by impacts so much, even the shock quartz. I have a paper I wrote on this. You can go through this 10,000 word paper that's available online. And I go through all the painstaking details of how you can create shock quartz and magmas cooling and they shock themselves and so they cool quickly and how quickly magmas move up towards the Earth's surface. Much, much quicker than they teach you, but it's all in the publications. I reviewed it all in here. Looked at all this when I was studying the Chicxulub impact site by looking at those wells. And I found out that if there was an impact, it had to be really small because there's not enough melt. There's almost no iridium. There's really, they just tie a lot of things by circumstantial evidence to this. They try to say tsunamis hit Texas down here from that impact. But those are just, those are just tsunami waves from the flood. There's tsunami waves all over that deposited most of our sediments. You know, they're just trying to tie the story in. And again, not even all the paleontologists believe it. There's people that try to say, oh, it's from volcanic activity over in India. You know, the Deccan Plateau, and there's other people that dis disagree with this, but yet this is a story you hear all the time. So myth busting four is this. There was likely no asteroid. This might just be an intrusion, like it was before the 70s. It was just an igneous intrusion. So you got a little bit of melt. It's really just magma coming in. Not enough melt to be a big impact. Almost no iridium at the site. Likely to drill just a basement high with that new well. It overlaps with a shallow basin and creates that semicircular anomaly. It's just a gravity feature. That the surface is perfectly flat. So there's really not a lot of strong physical evidence for an impact. If there was, it was very, very small. It just sort of gone poof in the middle of the flood. You know, that, not that there weren't impacts, but I don't believe this was very big, if at all. So how did the dinosaurs go extinct? People ask me that all the time. I'm like, I have no idea. And I walk off. No, we're going to give you some ideas. I think partly because of climate differences from the pre-flood to the post-flood. Pre-flood world, I believe, was a global greenhouse. You're all in kind of a Pangea world with elevation differences where animals lived. This thing had its food. It stayed where it was because the animals it was eating loved the food near that area. So it liked those animals, and so it stayed near those animals. After the flood, things were all mixed up. The world was cooler. There was an ice age for a while, which narrowed the range where the dinosaurs could live if they were truly cold-blooded, which I believe the evidence supports. And so you're stuck in this range where you're now impacting with humans as well. Human interaction probably played a part. All these legends about dinosaurs or you know, knights killing dragons, like St. George and the dragon, they were probably killing small dinosaurs after the flood. Before the flood, humans and dinosaurs probably lived in separate areas, but after the flood, they had no choice but to live where humans are living, just like crocodiles live where we live and alligators and snakes. But I think the dinosaurs are considered more of a menace, and they probably were killed out. But they were around long enough for stuff to be written about dinosaurs. And, and there's a lot of post-flood evidence. We have a whole wall at our Discovery Center that shows a lot of these. Uh, but there's whole books other people have written on 
petroglyphs and petroglyphs and carvings and ancient texts on dinosaurs. It says in Job 40, Behold now Behemoth, which I made with you. The, the you know, people that translated King James didn't know what that word meant, so they just left it. He says, It eats grass like an ox. The strength is in his loins. The force in the muscles of his belly it moves his tail like a cedar, which dinosaurs' tails were there balancing as they walked. Even the T-Rex balanced out the head. God made these things wonderfully crafted, designed to do what they did. His bones are like bars of iron. The leg bones of these sauropods were solid. Their backbone and their necks were hollowed out. God made their neck bones light so they could have these big long necks and little bitty heads so they wouldn't be laying in the ground all the time. Perfectly designed to balance out or pivot around those hips. But people scoffed at the grass. They said, there's no grass fossils with the time of dinosaurs. That's nonsense. This can't be a dinosaur. Well, in 2005, again, they, in India, they found big long-necked dinosaurs with dinosaur dung, fossilized dinosaur dung. Never thought you'd hear about dung in church. Fossilized dinosaur dung, like horse dung, tells you what it ate. All right? You said what it is? So they looked at what, five species of grass. They found five species of grass in the dinosaur dung. So these things were eating grass. The Bible is right all along. Why do we doubt the Bible? In verse chapter 41, it talks about Leviathan. The smoke came from its mouth. There had to be some sort of smoke or fire coming out of its mouth. We haven't found that yet. We may not, but if the Bible says it, it must be true. Just like these things did eat grass, like an ox. And we can see these carvings, ancient dinosaur artwork. This is the Narmer palette from Egypt. You can see what looks like two long-necked dinosaurs with their necks intertwined. But notice the legs. The legs are coming straight down. No reptile today has legs coming straight down. We didn't know that until 1841. Here's a better picture. You can see better in the back. Mesopotamian cylinder, you roll it out and you get this. It's in the Louvre in Paris now because the French stole a lot of stuff. Because at the time, they could. So they roll this out and you can see the same pattern almost you see in the Egyptian one. Long-necked, what appears to be dinosaurs. Long necks, long tails, and the legs coming straight down. How did they know the legs came straight down if they had seen a real dinosaur? Two sauropods from Carlisle Cathedral. Dave back there, with Dave waved to the crowd. He was there. He took a picture better than this. <laughs> Just last year he was there and he took this picture. He had him roll back the carpet. It's covered up now because it's getting you know, too worn. And you can see the, what looks like two sauropods. Arm, if there's long necks, long tails, and the legs coming straight down. This is you know, almost three, four, 350, 400 years before they knew that. How did they know if they hadn't seen dinosaurs? They would have made them sprawled. And then you go to the to Prom Temple, I believe it's called, about the 11th, 12th century. Cambodia, they discovered this 20, 30 years ago. We have a rendition of this in our museum. You can see the big wall that shows a, a lion, a monkey, a water buffalo, and in the middle of it all is this thing. Every other animal's real. This one's probably real too, but they don't want to say it's real because it looks like a stegosaurus. It looks, notice the legs. Are they sprawling? Come straight down. We didn't know the stegosaurus plates even stuck up on its back for sure until 30 years ago. How did they know? Because they probably saw one. So in conclusion, there's four evolutionary myths about dinosaurs that I think are busted by looking at the rocks. Number one, dinosaurs did not have ancestral forms. You look below where they find dinosaurs, even T-Rexes, all dinosaurs. You look in the rocks below where they should have ancestral forms, and there's nothing there. Secondly, dinosaurs did not evolve into birds. God tells us he made birds on day five, and dinosaurs on day six, they're completely different animals. They're not the same. Anything with feathers on them today, it looks to be like those really are birds. And a lot of what they're calling proto-feathers are just collagen that get squished in the burial process. But they're calling those proto-feathers. And they're sinking these evolutionary lies into your kids and your grandkids. Maybe even to yourself. Third, dinosaurs evolved, you know, are not millions of years old. They're only 4,500 years old. Or 4,400, depending on the exact number of the, when the flood was. These are buried in the flood. The dinosaurs after the flood didn't leave fossils. So we don't see evidence of dinosaurs after the flood. Things that die today don't leave fossils. They decay away. Most of the humans that probably died in the flood didn't get buried deep enough to become a fossil. And so they decayed away or are washed into the oceans. I talked in the first service as a dinosaur they found in the North Sea, 70 miles offshore. They drilled an oil well, one and a half miles down. Up a core this big 
and there was a toe bone of a plateosaurus in it, a long neck dinosaur they could identify. How did it get out there? How, why didn't it get eaten by something? And they find all sorts of dinosaurs mixed with marine fossils all the time. Sharks with T-Rexes. Six species found with T-Rexes in Montana in the same Hell Creek formation. Fish, clams, ocean critters, all over the world mixed with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs found in marine rocks. The only dinosaurs in Ireland are found in limestones. And nobody believed these are dinosaurs because, oh, it's marine rocks. We're not going to find them. And they finally went out there after the guy passed away. Well, yeah, he was right. These are real dinosaurs. And they have to explain, oh, they must have washed out to sea. But things that wash out to sea, they don't last long. They get eaten. They get scavenged. Things today don't become fossils. So we don't see the post-flood dinosaurs. They all disappeared because they rotted away. Nobody saved them. Dinosaurs did go extinct, but it wasn't until after the flood. There were about 60 kinds on the ark. And there's lots of evidence and carvings and paintings all over the world to show that dinosaurs really were after the flood for a while. But of course, the evolutionary community scoffs at that, but yet they can't explain the legs coming straight down the bodies. And the soft tissues, point three, shows they really are only about 4,500 years old. All those original tissues they find year after year, every year, but every month there's a new one. A new discovery of, oh, original tissues, original proteins. How can this be? And they just keep teaching their stories and their lies. These are millions of years old. We don't know how they're preserved, but they must be millions of years old because we know they are because they believe their age dates, which that's another whole lecture in itself. The age dates, for those of you that are mathematicians in here, are based on four or five major assumptions. And uh, two of them, they just, well, we're going to assume this, we're going to assume this. It's like having four unknowns and two equations for you mathematicians in here. You know that's impossible. So they assume a couple of them, and they, oh, look, it works. And it seems to work wonderfully because they already have the story made up. If it doesn't fit, they say, oh, it's contaminated. There's a lot of numbers they throw out because it doesn't mix, fit the story. And so there's a lot of mixing of different methods don't give you the same results either. And almost every time, I talk about this in my book, Carved in Stone back there, almost every time they test what they know the age of that volcano is, 2,000 years old or 1,000 years ago when this erupted, almost every time they test it, they get numbers that are hundreds of thousands of years old or millions of years old. Even Mount St. Helens, they tested the rocks. Steve Austin, my predecessor at ICR, took some rocks that are 10 years old at Mount St. Helens because they saw it erupt and it formed. This lava cooled at the surface. He sampled it, sent it off to labs. He got 230 million from one lab, 2 million from another lab. And it formed 10 years ago. And so, they, well, there was minerals formed early in the earth and, you know, and they have to go around and around and around trying to explain almost every time they test it. And they've tested these, you know, the secular community has done this. They've published all these articles testing Hawaiian volcanoes and Mount Etna in Italy and all these different things. Never even close. Orders of magnitude off. And yet they keep telling you, we're right. These are facts. So you can't believe the age dates and the fossils are showing that they're young. So what happened is dinosaurs were on the ark. They got off the ark and they went extinct in the 4,000 or so years after the flood. Uh, probably because probably humans were killing them off as well. You can read more about this in my dinosaur book in the back. Uh, Dave's got a bunch of these. He doesn't want to haul back to Dallas. Uh, this is the third greatest book ever written. So I wrote this one before the second greatest book ever written, which is carved in stone back there. We still got a bunch of those. Uh, those explain dinosaurs a little bit too and the soft tissues and the chicks loop craters actually in that book. Uh, a little tiny bit in this book, I think, Marvels of God's Design. Uh, but I didn't have all the research done yet. And so you can either go online and find that paper or you can pick up the book with a lot of other good stuff in it. But this was, I used to teach a college class at a public school and I couldn't say much. You know, I could say, here's the dinosaurs, here's the history of dinosaur discoveries, some really interesting stuff in here I put in this book. But I was able to show how it ties into the Bible, how they fit on the ark. And at the end, I was able to show some of my research in North America why they were found where they are. Because those areas were flooded a little bit later in the flood, not flooded right away. That's why dinosaurs are kind of found in the middle rocks, because they were a little higher elevation than the earliest flood. And then my wife and I wrote two books on this so far. We got a third one coming out, uh, maybe next year or the year after. Uh, but this is Big Plans for Henry. This is a children's book that we wrote for our grandkids because it's a story you can read to your kids with a few Bible facts and science facts in there as well. And it's not that long. It's about 30-some pages, I think. Uh, but then we wrote a follow-up when he got off the ark. So this one, Henry grows up and gets lost, and ultimately God calls him to the ark. So I ruined the story for you. So he survives, but uh, we don't mention anybody else. 
Uh, but uh, and he meets a gal, and anyway, his sisters, they have, they have, you can tell because they have, apparently they had, had eyelashes. <laughs> apparently, female dinosaurs had eyelashes, and uh, that's what made them females. And, but, uh, you know, the cartoonish look is, is one thing, and, but, but it, the story of this is really that God has a plan. He has a plan for you, he has a plan for the animals, and he had a plan for Henry. And, you know, he has a plan for, based on Jeremiah 29, 11. You know, he had a plan for me. He brought me to ICR when I was 52 years old. I had no idea what the plan for my life was. I kept thinking, there's got to be something more to do in life. You know, so God's using my research. When I used to work for the oil company to learn how to use the oil wells and the data in my research I'm doing now and the, and the teaching I did at the college for many, many years to kind of, believe it or not, dumb it down so it's understandable. You know, this intense science work, uh, you've got to be able to make it understandable somewhat. And you heard my first talk, it's difficult. But it does show there really was a global flood. And so we try to make the, but this was, this was nice. A lot of our information is just facts. This is actually stories you can read, and the kids, the kids love them. There's two of these back there. I think the third one doesn't come out yet. But uh, each one of them is based on a verse, and it's, it's, it's really compelling because it makes a lesson. At the end, it talks about salvation through Jesus. You can read that at the end as well. And there's a DVD set back there that shows four 22-minute DVDs of dinosaurs. One of these is all about the dinosaur soft tissue and the original proteins. I think episode three. And then we didn't bring this one, did we? Okay. Well, anyway, the, the information here I used, I broke it down a few pieces that I put in this book, but the dinosaur marvels of God's design has it all in there and more. And so that's actually a better book anyway, in some ways, because it's got better pictures. And then if you don't have any more than $10 in your pocket, we're going to go to McDonald's and try to get a hamburger at McDonald's for $10 now. Uh, Save yourself the calories and buy one of these. This is the best book we sell for the best price, $10. We should, we should charge 15 or 20 for this. It's over 400 pages long, and it's got a lot of short chapters. It covers everything. Dinosaurs, evidence from astronomy of a young universe, young Earth, evidence from geology of the global flood, evidence of, from biology that we're not related to chimps at all, and even stuff about apologetics and the gap theory and why we don't believe the earth is old, and we don't believe to put millions of years in between verse 1 and verse 2 of the Bible and all that. It's all in this book. Very short chapters. This is the kind of book you need to take to college. If you're going to Baylor, for example, you can hear evolution. If you go to Texas, you can hear evolution. If you go to A&M, you're going to hear evolution. Stephen F. Austin, what's the name of that school right here? I'm not from here, so. All these schools are all going to teach you evolution. Almost every school in the country will teach you evolution. And whether a Christian school or not, there's only a few Christian schools that don't. Very few. You can count them all right here on two hands that don't teach evolution for millions of years. And our seminaries all teach evolution millions of years. Almost every one of them. And so we got to catch these kids when they're young. And this is the kind of book people got to take with them. Or they succumb to the lies because it just seems so inviting. I almost bought into it when I was going to school. It, it's, it's very difficult to see there's another side to this that I'm not hearing about. And so you've got to hear speakers like me and hopefully others because they're better. Uh, and you know, read our books, read the publications from us, AIG even. You know, Ken Ham used to work for ICR and he went on his own. And so they have good stuff they put out too. Uh, so you know, get books from these organizations. And I can't tell you everything, but the books sell more. And uh, Dave's ready to come up and give away because you guys didn't sign up during my lecture. I'm sorry. I was going to give away books, and I'm going to quit right there. Thank you very much for listening.